Good evening, everybody. It is uh, wonderful to be here this evening. Another day that we get to serve the Lord and worship together, though it be through distant worship. But wherever we are, we know the Lord is with us. And I encourage you now to remove any distraction from you. Turn off the TV, turn off the radio. You know, don't turn off your computer or phone. You're watching me on. But let us remove all distractions so we can focus on what, what God wants us to hear tonight so we may worship him in word and deed. And as we start our worship, let us start with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you that you allow us to study together, Lord. And as we look at the Apostles' Creed, I pray that you open our eyes to what it has for us, that this doctrinal statement that explains what we believe, that, we, that you show us how it applies for us today, that we may use it to share with others your gospel truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostles' Creed, we've studied for a couple weeks now the very beginnings of the Apostles' Creed. And up to this point, we were studying about God, and then we are now switching to study about Jesus. And it says this to the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary and suffered under Pontius Pilate. Was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the, to the dead and the third day rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy, we can just say, say Catholic, we say universal church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we're going to focus on two aspects of this creed. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. Those two uh, statements, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and birth born of the Virgin Mary is what we want to focus on first. And in this, in this, we have some very well-meaning theologians deny that Jesus was born of a virgin conceived by the Holy Spirit. Those who deny this use rational thinking. The idea of taking the miraculous out of the Bible. They're using only human and earthly understanding. The idea is that there's no way this could possibly be true. This is just too much. We're taking it a little too far. When it comes to the Bible, they take it as not literal. If they do not believe in the virgin birth, it's because they do not believe in the literal word of God. The Bible is more of a guidebook. They look at it like Homer's Odyssey. They're like the stories of the Greek gods. They're moral lessons. There's moral lessons inside of these fables. Yes, they're based in somewhat fact, but they're sensationalized. And they're teaching us some great moral truth that we have to peel away the layers of the story like an onion to get to the truth. They rationalize their thinking to take out the miraculous. They rationalize the miraculous of the Bible and take it as allegorical. They take it as just a fun story to teach us a moral lesson. But with that, there's many problems when they do this. The biggest problem they come up with is inerrancy. The idea that the Bible isn't true. The idea of who even wrote the Bible. What, was it really written by God? And if it's not written by God, it's, it's full of errors. So I have to ask, the problem is view is, who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the Word of God? Well, go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but 
holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, when the prophecy that Jesus would be born of a virgin, and when Gabriel and the angel prophesied to Mary, said, you, who is a virgin, will give birth to the Savior, that wasn't man's idea, it was God. And if God wrote that, then when Mary gave birth to a virgin, Mary being a virgin gave birth, it's a prophecy coming true that has to be God using scripture, inerrant, true, 100% accurate. The idea of saying the virgin birth is not true means the Bible itself cannot be trusted. The Bible itself is not true. When it comes to inerrancy, we ask who wrote the Bible. And the second question I want to ask is, why was the Bible written? Why was the Bible written? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 say this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The whole Bible, from beginning to end, all scripture is inspired by God, even the virgin birth. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The idea that the virgin birth is not true means that the whole Bible crumbles because in 2 Timothy chapter 3 says all scripture, not some scripture, not the scripture that we like, the scripture that we understand, the scripture that we can easily explain. It says all scripture, even the virgin birth. The problem with using the idea of the virgin birth not being true is just a, a moral guide attacks the foundation of the Word of God. When we take the virgin birth away, we have a problem with original sin. If this is just a moral story, if God was not real, if the virgin birth was not real, if you say the virgin birth never happened, what do we do about sin? How do we explain how we get rid of sin? We can't. But if the virgin birth isn't true, is any of the Bible true? If the virgin birth isn't true, what about creation? If the virgin birth isn't true, then I can believe in evolution because this is a moral guide, not truth. And if then I believe in evolution, I take away original sin. And if there's no original sin and there's no virgin birth, there's no savior. And why does that even matter? Because if there's no original sin, no virgin birth, I don't need a savior because I don't have original sin. I don't have sin in my life. When we take away the virgin birth, we take away the savior. We take away the reason we need a savior. We take away what the savior does, dies for our sins and raises from the dead three days later. We take away his crucifixion. He's not just half God, half man anymore. He's just man. Jesus born of Mary, an illegitimate marriage. Because when Jesus, Jesus was put into Mary through the Holy Spirit, Joseph, her betrothed, said, I'm going to divorce you. You're supposed to be a virgin, but now you're pregnant. I want to divorce you because you cheated on me. But what does Joseph do? Find out, an angel appears to Joseph and says, Hey, listen, Mary's a virgin, this is God's work, and the Savior is going to be born. So Joseph marries her. If she was illegitimately with child, that means that Jesus is not supernatural. He is not God. He's just a regular man. He's normal. He's a sinner like you and me. His death would mean nothing. Take away the virgin birth, our whole foundation of salvation crumbles and falls apart. The virgin birth stands at the cornerstone of our salvation. 
because that is Jesus, fully God, fully man, coming to earth to live a sinless life, to die a sacrifice for us, for those who accept. So those are the problems that we have with those who reject the virgin birth. One, the inerrancy of Scripture. And two, without the virgin birth, we have no salvation. But those who accept the virgin birth, for those like myself who accept that Jesus was born, born of a virgin, we accept the Bible to be true. That there is a pur uh, purpose from the very beginning. Genesis 3.15 says that man, through Eve, man would crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent would bruise the heel of the man. That's talking about Jesus, talking about Mary giving birth to Jesus and Jesus crushing the serpent's head. From the very beginning, God had a plan. Jesus did not come from man. Look at Romans, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. What this is talking about is simply this. Through Adam, sin is in the world. Through Adam, sin is through the world. Because I have a child, two daughters and a son, they are sinners because they came from me. Because I came from Adam. Every human born has a father. That father, the sin is imputed to their child. Through man, sin enters. And so... If Jesus was born with a human father, he would have a sin nature. But he wasn't. He did not have a human father. He was divine. He was fully God and fully man. We accept the Bible as true, that there is a purpose from the very beginning that God had a plan and it involved a virgin birth. We accept miracles Sin comes from man. Jesus did not come from man. We don't understand how it works. I don't know how in the world it works. No one does. It says in the Gospels that the Holy Spirit came over Mary. And there was Jesus inside her belly. That's just how it works. We don't need to know. What we need to do is accept it. It's called the mysteries of the faith. It's okay that we believe in the impossible. That's okay. We believe through the virgin birth that his death was sufficient because he was a spotless lamb of God. He was accepted. We were forgiven. We accept the mysteries of faith. We don't understand it, but we accept it. In accepting the virgin birth, we accept who Jesus is, fully God and fully man. We believe that what, what all this is, is a purpose to save us from our sins. When we believe in the virgin birth, we believe God has a purpose on the earth to save us from our sins. How does he do this? Dying on the cross and three days later, resurrecting. Why does Jesus do this? Why did God have this plan in place? Because God's purpose from the very beginning, is to show us His love through His Son so that we may glorify Him with our lives. When we believe in the virgin birth, the very foundation of we believing in the virgin birth through the Holy Spirit is we believe that God has a plan and that plan is through His Son Jesus to die on the cross, three days later rise again so He can show us His love through Jesus, God has a plan to show us his love through Jesus 
so that we can glorify him. It all boils down to God's love. The first part of our study is very simple. That he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. When we accept it, we accept who Jesus is, what his purpose was, and that God has a plan to show us his love through his Son so that we can glorify him. The next part says he suffered under Pontius Pilate. That Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Well, when we look at this, we have to understand that there's five aspects of his suffering. To understand his suffering, there's five aspects that I want to look at. The first is the historical aspect. The term Pontius Pilate puts a historical time and place to his sufferings. There is a Roman record of Pontius Pilate. There's physical evidence. You can actually go to Israel, and in the amphitheater, there is a rock with Pontius Pilate carved into it. Pontius Pilate was a real person. What this does is it shows us this is not a made-up fairy tale. Because there's a real person, that means there's real eyewitnesses. That when the Gospels recorded the sufferings of Christ, and Paul was sharing it with the other apostles around the known world, there would have been eyewitnesses to say, that didn't happen. But that's not what happened. People actually saw their eyewitness who could verify or deny, which lends the credibility to the original event. The first aspect of suffering under Pontius Pilate is the historical factor, lending credibility to say, this is not a fairy tale, this actually happened. The second aspect of his suffering is it fulfills prophecy. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And I would like to read part of Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is Isaiah chapter 53. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and, we, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before it shears its silence. He opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison, prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich at his death. Because he had none. He had done no violence. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering of first sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In Isaiah 53, it talks about the suffering servant, Jesus, the Savior of the world, that he's going to have to suffer. So in Jesus' suffering, we see the fulfillment of prophecy. His suffering also shows us his humanity. Jesus truly suffered. If Jesus was just fully God, and then sometimes fully man, that would not work. But Jesus was fully God all the time, but yet at the same time, fully man. How do I understand this? I don't. No one can understand the duality of Christ. 
that he was fully God and fully man. We, it's, it's a mystery, but we accept it because the virgin birth. Because he was fully God and fully man, he suffered like a man. God suffered. It showed his humanity. If he wasn't man, he could have said no. You're not going to smack me in the face. You're not putting a crown of thorns on me. I'm not going to bleed because I am God. But that's not what happened. He was fully man, yet fully God. He suffered. In the book of Mark, we see that Jesus was hungry. In the book of John, we see that Jesus was thirsty. The book of John and Mark re report that Jesus was tired. He needed to sleep. Jesus bled like us. He felt pain like us. Why? Because Jesus was fully human. He was not just God walking around on this earth visiting. He was fully man, yet fully God. His suffering shows us not only the historicity, histori histori I just made that word up, the history of his suffering, it really happened. It didn't just fulfill prophecy, it also showed his humanity. It also shows us his humility. His humility. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face, that is Jesus, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. A very famous passage. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to be arrested, and he falls on his face and says, Father, Father, it's going to hurt. This is going to be unpleasant. I'm about to be beaten tortured, and crucified. This scares me. I, this is going to hurt. I don't want to do this, but I want to do it if it's your will. He, humili he, hu he suffered because he accepted God's will. He's the Lord of lords, yet he humbled himself for us. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. It's going to hurt God, and if there's another way. But I will do it if that's what you want me to do. He humbled himself knowing the cost. He knew what was about to happen, but he said, God, I'm going to follow you. Not my will, your will. He humbled himself because he loved us. Not only does the suffering have a historical aspect, not only does it fulfill prophecy, show us his humanity, show us humility, it shows us the cost of sin. Sin carries a heavy cost. We must not forget that sin carries a heavy, heavy cost. The pain of our sin was the death of our Savior. There was suffering because we rejected God. We suffered. Jesus suffered because of our sin. It wasn't just a death. It was the beatings, the humiliation, the crown of thorns, the whippings. Why? Because we sinned. If we did not sin, if we did not reject God, there'd be no need for our Savior to suffer. But we did sin, and our Savior suffered. And finally, the reason for our suffering. Because of us, we sinned, and He loves us. And He paid our price. Because God is a holy God. The cost of our rebellion is death. That death was suffering. The death on the cross. Someone had to die because of our sin. The perfect lamb. I want to read you a quote from Al Mohler. And this, this talks about the reason Christ had to suffer. Jesus entered the place of atonement himself. He entered dressed in the garments of a high priest to do the atoning 
for the sins of the people. Then in a shocking turn of events, he removed his priestly garments and sacrificed himself on the altar. He brought no goat or sheep to sacrifice. The system had not accomplished a final or lasting redemption. He entered the heavenly tabernacle himself to lay himself down upon the altar as a perfect and last sacrifice for the sins of the people. He shed his blood and poured himself out. The crimson flow and scarlet tide of his suffering and crucifixion made propitiation for our sins forever. Al Mohler says it beautifully, paints a beautiful picture of why Jesus had to suffer. Jesus had to suffer so that we did not have to suffer. Jesus had to suffer so that we could live. Jesus had to suffer so that we could glorify him. It's all part of God's plan. God's plan is to show us his love through his son's suffering so that we can glorify him. We were separated from God. So God sent his son down on earth to suffer death on the cross so that it would bridge the gap between us and God so we can glorify God with our lives. Why did Christ suffer? For our sin. So how does this apply to us? How does the virgin birth and Christ's suffering apply to our daily life? Well, the virgin birth lies at the very foundational doctrines of who Christ is. Who is Jesus Christ? He is fully God, fully man, our Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. Of what Christ did, our salvation. The doctrine of salvation is tied directly into the virgin birth. The virgin birth deals with who Jesus is, the Messiah, fully God, fully man. It deals with salvation, our sin. If he wasn't born of the virgin, if he wasn't fully God, fully man, salvation is null and void. It deals with the inspiration of the Bible. If we believe in the, the virgin birth, we're saying that we believe the Bible is fully true without errors. We also are saying that we believe in the Holy Spirit. By believing in the in the virgin birth, by believing the virgin birth, we are confirming who Jesus is, our need for salvation, the inspiration of the Bible, and the power of the Holy Spirit. By a simple fact that I say, I believe that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, I am agreeing and confirming the foundations of my faith. And when it comes to the suffering of Jesus Christ under Pontius Pilate, we are saying that God was fully man, and Jesus was fully God and fully man, and suffered because of us. Our sin carries a great weight, and he took our place, so we did not have to. When we say that we believe in Jesus Christ, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, we're saying that he is fully God and fully man. He suffered because of my sin. A great weight was taken from me and placed on him. And I owe him my life. So my question for you tonight is that if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and he took your place, he took your suffering on him because of his love for you. How are you showing your love for him? How are you repaying that debt? We repay that debt by living for him every day. Are you living for God today? Are you living up to the sacrifice that Jesus made for you? Or are you taking advantage of it? Many Christians are just taking advantage of his death. I'm forgiven. Are you going to be one of them? Or are you going to live your life in a way to repay the debt that we owe that he paid? How are you living today? Let's pray. Father God, by believing the virgin birth. We are accepting who you are. 
by accepting who you are, we accept that you are our Savior and you suffered for me. By accepting your suffering, I'm accepting the fact that you died on the cross and three days later rose again. By saying that, I believe that you took my place. I should have been the one suffering. I should have been the one dying. But you took my place. How I repay you is a daily devotion to you. That every day, every day, every day, I live for you. Help me to repay my debt by living and glorifying you in everything I do. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for coming out tonight and watching our series on the Apostles' Creed. I hope you're enjoying this, and I want to encourage you to come out this Sunday for our drive-in service at 9 a.m. We'll be on radio station 90.1 on the FM dial. We'll love to have you come out this Sunday at 9 a.m. I love you, I'm praying for you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.